start, but good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brent Helwig, and as a member of the faculty and dean of the School of Law, I'd like to welcome all of you to our lecture in commemoration of the national holiday celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This is the law school's central contribution to a robust slate of programming the university has planned to commemorate the King holiday. I'd like to recognize and express our appreciation to the members of the MLK Day Commemorative Events Committee for undertaking all of this work. That committee is chaired by Tammy Futrell, Dean for Diversity, Inclusion, and Student Engagement for the University, and our own Assistant Dean of Student Affairs, Trinae Mason, ser serves on that committee as well. I'd like to thank um, both of them in particular for making today's lecture a reality. This afternoon, we are honored to have with us Natasha Merle, who serves as a senior attorney for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. My colleague on the WNL Law faculty, Professor Brandon Hasbrook, along with others at our school, helped us recruit Ms. Merle to WNL for this event. And in just a few moments, I will yield the podium to him to provide a formal introduction. But before I do so, I'd like to convey my gratitude to Ms. Merle for making the trip from New York to Lexington to share her message and to help us thoughtfully honor the legacy of Dr. King by focusing on our country's continued pursuit of the ideal of freedom. I also like to thank all of you in attendance this afternoon. It is refreshing and uplifting to come together as a community, not only to collectively honor the profound contributions that Martin Luther King Jr. made to our society, but for each of us to consider what steps that we today in 2020, over 50 years after the tragic passing of Dr. King, to consider what steps we can take to make our society more just, more equitable, more tolerant, more forgiving, and ultimately more loving. With that, I will ask Professor Hasbrook to um, introduce our distinguished guest. But again, thank you all very much for being here with us this afternoon. Thank you, Dean Helwig, for your warm welcome and your commitment to fostering important conversations on a host of issues, including racial justice and equality. I also want to thank Dean Mason for your brilliance in making our students' lives better. Finally, thank you to Wendy Raines for just being awesome. <laughs> your work never goes unnoticed. It is my privilege and honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Natasha Merle. No words can, describe, can do her record of achievement justice but I must try. Natasha currently serves as senior counsel to the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, LDF for short. In her four years with LDF, Natasha has established herself as a leader on issues concerning racial justice and criminal justice, political participation, and educational opportunities. Her work in these spaces Spaces where the law has constructed racial inequality inspires. From death penalty litigation to voting rights litigation, Natasha is on the front lines challenging racially discriminatory laws. She is, as Dr. King said in a letter from a Birmingham jail, an extremist for justice, a kind of justice that eliminates all forms of racial subordination. Although there is much work to be done, Natasha's example should give us all hope of a better, more just tomorrow. A tomorrow that is braided in love, empathy, and mercy. A tomorrow that is ours, all of ours. So thank you, Natasha, for working tirelessly on ensuring that the injustices of yesterday and today are not on repeat tomorrow. You are simply extraordinary. Please join me in welcoming Natasha Murrow. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, 
Thank you first to Washington and Lee University School of Law and to Brandon for inviting me here today uh, for this opportunity to speak to everybody. Uh, it is a great honor. Um, yesterday actually marked my four year anniversary at the Legal Defense Fund and so the opportunity uh, to speak to you and reflect on the important work of Dr. King alongside that of the Legal Defense Fund is just that much more special to me. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to talk a little bit about my professional background to kind of frame where my remarks are coming from. Uh, I've always known that I wanted to help people, uh, specifically the black community and those with the least among us. Uh, but what does that mean? I could have been a teacher or a social worker or a dozen of other jobs that focus on helping people, but I decided to become a lawyer. And specifically, I wanted to do work that not only saved my client's life, but the lives and the dignity of their families and their communities. And so after law school, I became a death penalty attorney. I've worked on death penalty cases in Texas, Arizona, and California. Um, that was all before the Legal Defense Fund. I currently now have cases, death cases in Alabama as well. But focusing on my career before LDF, um, that is where I focused my death penalty work. So I've attended hearings where the prosecutor was adamant that my client's life had no value. I've uh, presented at clemency hearings uh, where I focus on my client's history, his life, uh, and the law to beg for mercy for my client's life. Um, all the while, my client was not sitting at counsel table with me. He was literally sitting in a cage next to me. I have sat with my client until the second he was taken to the execution chamber. Um, and when he was taken, we don't say see you later or see you next time. All there is to say is goodbye. Um, there came a point in Texas when I was visiting clients uh, and it became clear that my clients all came from the same or very similar communities. One client said, hey, do you represent so-and-so? I dated his sister in middle school. Um, and so I grappled with this issue. Why do my clients come from the same or similar communities? Um, and it's bigger than just one case. It is systemic. It is racial inequality in education and housing and jobs. It is the school to prison pipeline. And of course, it's discrimination in the criminal justice system. Dr. King once said, the goal of America is freedom. I believe that is more than just freedom from enslavement or imprisonment. That is the opportunity to seek the foundation of what this country is. It's the opportunity uh, of fully participating in this country and fully participating in democracy. That is how America fulfills its goal of freedom. So it was those cases and those clients and what I learned from them that pushed me to the Legal Defense Fund because there was too many inequities to be challenged, too many injustices to challenge on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and I knew at LDF I could address the systemic racial discrimination uh, that contributed to the lives of my clients and their communities. Um, I remember getting my offer to join the Legal Defense Fund, and I want to share it with you mostly as a cautionary tale to the law students in their room. So one day, Sherilyn Eiffel calls me. She is the, director, the president and director counsel at the Legal Defense Fund. She's the head of our office, and she calls me, and she says, Natasha, what do you want to do in the future? And so I would like to say I had a perfectly polished response that was fitting for this momentous occasion, but I did not. I simply said to Sherilyn Eiffel, I said, I just want to sue racist. Full stop. That is all I said. <laughs> now, even if that is true, it is too simplistic and it's not completely accurate. I want to stop individuals, institutions, government actors who engage in racial discrimination, whether they have racism in their heart or not. I am not here to absolve them of their racism, nor am I here to label them as one. I seek systemic reform that will lead to racial equality. So that is my cautionary tale for the law students. When your time comes for your dream job, and it will have a prepared response, so you do not say to the head of the office, I want to sue racist. 
So while I may not have been as eloquent as Dr. King, it is my goal to carry out his vision and his work and to create a country that fulfills its promise of equality for all Americans. Today I want to touch on three areas. Uh, first, Dr. King's and LDF's voting history and where an example of where they have crossed paths. Uh, the past and the present of voter suppression with the 2020 election upon us, that should be at the forefront of our mind um, and the integrity of our elections. So as you know, Dr. King was a civil rights leader and activist. Um, LDF lawyers actually represented Dr. King throughout his years of leadership uh, throughout the South, including in Selma in 1965. Jack Greenberg, who was the president and director counsel of the Legal Defense Fund immediately after Thurgood Marshall said, when a great leader of the mass movement emerged, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., LDF, was his lawyer. In 1965, Dr. King and others focused their attention on Selma, Alabama um, and, and their drive to win voting rights for black voters in the South. However, Alabama's governor, George Wallace, was a staunch opponent to civil rights and to the registration, uh, the voter registration of black voters in his state. Thus, when hundreds of demonstrators began their 54 mile march, from Selma to Montgomery, they were met by state troopers uh, after crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge. One of those demonstrators, uh, apologies, sorry, these are <laughs> pictures of Dr. King with Thurgood Marshall and Jack Greenberg and other LDF attorneys. Um, but this is uh, Representative John Lewis uh, that day in Selma crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. And when they crossed the bridge, the demonstrators were attacked um, you've likely seen a lot of these pictures um, around uh, the, the anniversary of Bloody Sunday as it became known. Um, it was te actually televised on TV and many people were um, outraged, at least those people who did not think that that was America. Others knew and were not surprised. Um, the demonstrators were attacked with nightsticks, tear gas, and whips. Um, Albert Turner was one individual who marched alongside Representative John Lewis, uh, kind of describing his day um, on Bloody Sunday. In response to this racial terror, Dr. King, two days later, led another attempt to cross the bridge. However, he turned marchers around when they again were met by state troopers. Meanwhile, the Legal Defense Fund did what we do. We filed a lawsuit. Uh, we filed a lawsuit representing the marchers uh, and their denial of being able to pass over the bridge um, free of violence. Um, LDF actually ended up filing a plan for the march from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama that allowed safe passage for the marchers. Um, LDF has a very great archives department. We have a lot of our original documents saved uh, and we you know, obviously store them for historical purposes. Um, one such document is something like this from 1965, um, the original plan for the marchers to proceed safely. So I'm just wondering, has anybody ever spent any time in Selma, Alabama? I actually had not spent time in Selma, Alabama until I joined LDF as well. Um, every year, LDF takes a sojourn to Selma to commemorate Bloody Sunday and the passing of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And we do that um, because it's not only important to remember the sacrifices that those leaders, Dr. King, John Lewis, the sacrifices they made, but just because voting rights is of the utmost importance. Um, this is LDF staff last year um, at the 54th anniversary of uh, Bloody Sunday. That's actually Sherilyn Eiffel in the middle um, and some of my LDF colleagues around her in our LDF Justice t-shirts. Uh, and we march, uh, we, we, I don't wanna say reenact because we cannot reenact that day. We march in the steps of the marchers who marched across that bridge that day. Voting <laughs> is important because it's the fundamental political right because it is preservative of all rights. Um, Thurgood Marshall once said that it was a voting case, Smith v. Allwright, that was his most important case. It's a case uh, that he argued all the way to the Supreme Court and that ended 
um, all white primaries. So elections where only white voters were allowed to vote. Uh, Thurgood Marshall said that instead of his dozens of other cases that we all know of, such as Brown versus Board of Education, that was his most important case because it gave black people at least a hope of political power. Decades after Bloody Sunday and the enactment of the Voting Rights Act, states no longer use explicit poll taxes, literacy tests, dogs and whips, but voter suppression continues. We cannot lose sight of states such as Alabama, Texas, Florida that have created new barriers to make voting harder, including by eliminating early um, voting, passing restrictive voter ID laws, and purging legal voters from the rolls. All of this happening with the implicit and sometimes explicit support of the Justice Department. In regards to voter suppression, I want to focus on voter fraud. And I want to focus on that because I see a through line from the history to the present and probably into the future of voter fraud being used as a method of voter suppression. It's, it, the way voter fraud is used has changed, um, but its purpose and its intent and its effect remains the same. Uh, in fact, in the 1980s, LDF defended three individuals who became known as the Marion Three against prosecution for voter fraud. They were charged with voter fraud by Jeff Sessions, who at that time was a, a US attorney in Alabama, and they were represented by LDF attorneys. And one of those individuals was actually Albert Turner, um, who I mentioned earlier had marked with Dr. King. They became known as the Marion Three. After the, their defense, the judge eventually found that they had properly exercised uh, their voting rights, that they had not violated the Constitution. Um, that he also noted that there was credible evidence that Sessions' office was motivated by racial discrimination. And so though there was no evidence of voter fraud, and though they were found, they were cleared of all charges, the voter fraud, the investigation, the trial, the prosecution itself still had its intended effect of chilling voters. Many black voters that got caught up in the investigation still left the stand saying, this was just too much, I won't ever vote again. And that's the goal I see of investigations and prosecutions into unfounded allegations of voter fraud to scare people from even attempting to exercise their right to vote. Unless you think that this was a thing of the past, let's fast forward to present day, where I have litigated two cases where, the, again, the foundation and the premise was voter fraud. And we could focus still on Alabama. So let's first talk about um, LDF's challenge to Alabama's photo ID requirement. On their face, photo ID laws may seem reasonable to some. Um, the narrative is that you need a photo ID for everything. You need a photo ID to drive. You need a photo ID to uh, cash a check. But if we check our privilege, we recognize that this narrative is false. In some parts of Alabama, or in many parts across the country, people do not have cars. They cannot afford cars. Thus, that photo ID is not required. In rural parts of Alabama, there are places you can cash a check with other forms of ID and not a photo uh, ID that was now required that is now required to vote. So we see who's really impacted by the strict photo ID requirement and who was denied access to the ballot. 25% of black people, 16% of Latinx people lack government issued IDs, while only 8% of white people in Alabama like lack the required photo ID. And despite this, the Alabama legislature still passed this law based on unfounded suspicion uh, of voter fraud. Making the law even more harsh, Alabama largely closed 31 DMV offices in what's considered the Black Belt, counties with predominantly black population. They closed DMV offices, making it even more difficult for black voters to get the ID that was now required to vote. Further, the state also refuses to accept government issue public housing ID, which is overwhelmingly held by black voters and are government issued. We represent a number, at LDF, we represent a number of these voters. 
Um, we represented one woman who I met shortly after a fire destroyed all of her belongings, including, including her photo ID. Uh, she lived on a fixed income. She had two small children. She did not have a vehicle. She lives in rural Alabama where there is no public transportation. And so as you can imagine, recovering from this fire was a great lift for her. She was eventually able to get the supporting documents that you need before you even go get your photo ID. Um, she goes to get her photo ID. She's given a temporary ID. Her permanent one will come in the mail. 2016 comes. And on election day, she pays somebody to take her to the polling precinct because remember, she doesn't have a vehicle and there's no public transportation, but voting is so important to her, she pays somebody to take her to the polling precinct and back home. She goes to vote, she shows her temporary ID along with other identifications such as social security cards and other items. The poll worker does not allow her to vote because she does not have that permanent ID. So despite attempting to come, overcome all the hurdles the state had put in front of her um, and doing more than we could ask, she was still denied her right to vote. And I want to show here um, some pictures of our clients. The picture of me and the little boy, um, that's actually the client I was descri describing, and her son after her deposition. Um, that client actually died um, a few, a couple of months after her deposition, so fighting for her right to vote um, and still being denied her last chance to vote, uh, but still making her voice heard. Um, and the other client and her son, the day of her deposition, our clients are amazingly always extremely proud to tell their story and what it means to be denied their right to vote. Um, much like Dr. King, our clients make sacrifices to move, to move America closer to this goal of freedom. The, the conditions of resistance today may be different from the jail cells where Dr. King was held, but standing up, speaking truth to power in your community still takes courage, commitment, and sacrifice. And that's what our clients um, do every day. Uh, now talking about another case that I, I've worked on to kind of see this through line of voter fraud um, is a case that LDF brought uh, in 2017 called LDF versus Trump. And let me start by saying that contrary to what many people would have us believe, what our country is experiencing now, including voter suppression, is not an aberration. Uh, it is the very same playbook and nobody should be surprised. Um, I don't think any civil rights lawyer is surprised about where we are today. People um, occasionally ask me what it's like to be a civil rights lawyer in this time um, with this administration. Uh, and I read something from a former LDF attorney um, that was written back in the 1960s. Like I said, our archives department is amazing. I read a writing from a, 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 an attorney, an LDF attorney in the 1960s. It was in regards to his desegregation case um, in Mississippi. And you know, obviously, Brown versus Board of Education had already happened. School districts were not desegregating with all deliberate speed. So LDF attorneys were across the country trying to force these school districts to desegregate, representing their clients, still going to segregated schools. And so this is when he, he wrote this. He says, it is our duty to protect and defend the Constitution against assault by anyone, from hooded Klansmen to the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Civil Rights Division. That really resonates with me today, and that kind of tells you where we are. Whether it is a local agency, the state, or the President of the United States, I will not shy away from my duty to uphold the Constitution and seek freedom and equality for all. And so this case, LDF versus Trump, um, it's not a hypothetical, this need to challenge uh, discrimination and, supp and suppression even from your country's leaders. Um, in 2017, the president signed an executive order creating the Election Integrity Commission. Uh, its mission was to investigate voter fraud. So again, we have this through line of voter fraud uh, coming up again. Um, as you know, President Trump has stated that millions of people voted illegally in the election, costing him the popular vote. Even though there was no evidence of widespread voter fraud, I knew exactly who would be the target of this assault, communities of color. Um, 
and this is actually a quote from Trump at one of his rallies um, to a predominantly, if not solely, white audience. He says, voter fraud, this is before um, the election, voter fraud is all too common. And then they criticize us for saying that. But take a look at Philadelphia, what's been going on. Take a look at Chicago, take a look at St. Louis, take a look at some of these cities where you see things happening that are horrendous. Each of these cities are majority minority cities, upwards of 70% people of color. So to me, to point out and single out those cities where this widespread voter fraud was occurring, that was a subtext to make clear that people of color are the ones committing voter fraud. As a result of the commission, there were reports of thousands of Americans actively canceling their voter registration. We sued the administration and President Trump because vote, the voter fraud commission had one purpose and the same purpose we've seen for decades, to manufacture evidence of voter fraud in order to, suppre to suppress voters. This was actually the first, or the second time, excuse me, this was the second time LDF has ever sued the President of the United States. The commission's investigation in and of itself chilled voters of color, um, and that is why we brought a lawsuit, along with our sister organizations, such as the ACLU and other organizations also brought a suit, and shortly thereafter, the commission disbanded, saying um, too many lawsuits to defend. Though I have talked about you know, voter suppression and voter fraud as um, nothing more than a voter suppression tool, that is not to say that there are not things that can be done, should be done to protect the integrity of our elections. Um, it's not an overstatement that we are in the fight for our democracy. The 2020 election will decide the future of our country for generations, um, and there are things that need to be done in order to support the integrity of our elections. Um, and, and to me, that means expanding access to the franchise and ensuring every eligible voter is registered and votes and is able to vote and cast a ballot on election day. Some steps include, one, restoring the Voting Rights Act. Uh, the House has passed the Voting Rights Act Advancement Act of 2019, which has been referred to the Senate Committee on the Judiciary, and it responds the, to the current conditions of voting today by restoring the full protections of the original bipartisan Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, that's what we should be doing this year to honor Dr. King. Other states are taking steps to also expand the franchise or access to the franchise. That includes um, access to early voting as well as automatic voter registration. Um, as LDF, at LDF, we're obviously preparing for the 2020 elections. That includes our Prepare to Vote efforts, which is our nonpartisan election protection effort. Um, every election, not just presidential elections, but um, local elections, which is obviously very important. LDF attorneys, each, every LDF attorney is on the ground on election day throughout the South. We work with our local partners, our volunteers, law students to go to the polls and ensure that every eligible, eligible voter is allowed to vote. Even before the election, um, we try to address issues that are raised with us that so hopefully on election th day things um, go more smoothly. And I've brought documents that are around here somewhere um, that uh, kind of, that will direct people on what issues may arise in your community um, that you may want uh, assistance addressing. So for example, changing or closing of polling precincts, especially last minute, things of that nature that may need to be raised um, and addressed before election day. And there's a document around here that, um, that lists, in the hallway, that um, lists all those, um, that lists a few of those examples. There's also, I brought documents, um, because even after the 2020 elections, there's things that we at LDF are very um, mindful of, such as the census and redistricting. And so I brought documents that we've created at LDF that help uh, inform communities about the importance of the census and redistricting and what they can be doing in their local communities regarding those two um, elements. Um, so in closing, I want to say, um, there is no denying 
that these are difficult times. As a civil rights lawyer, I expect injustice. I anticipate inequities. I don't expect good times. I do expect a fair shot, and I work twice as hard because I know that's not what my clients are promised. Um, but despite this, I stay joyful. Yesterday, um, two of your classmates uh, picked me up from the airport and they asked me, how do I stay positive? They must have assumed that I lose a lot. Um, and so, um, my only response is my clients. Uh, bearing witness to their stories and letting them know that they are heard, sometimes that is a win for our communities um, the priv and the privilege of work fighting alongside them. So in celebrating Dr. King, I also honor my clients of today, from Little Rock, Arkansas, to Meridian, Mississippi, from Bology, Alabama, to Brooklyn, New York, uh, and in all the towns in between, I recognize and I lift up the courage of our clients who stand up for justice. So I'll end by saying that we must commit ourselves to the struggle of what is right. We must commit ourselves to the, being the energy that could power light in the darkest of times, as Dr. King referenced. And we must fight for the goal of freedom for America because it is our right as well as our duty. So thank you. So we have time for Q&A. Um, anyone have questions you want to direct to Ms. Merle? Please raise your hand. Please say your name, um, in particular, if, if you're a student. I think we'd like to hear that. If you don't ask the question, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Any questions? Professor McDonald, go ahead. Uh, it was a pleasure listening to your talk. It was inspiring. I was wondering if you could share with us um, the case that brought you the most satisfaction. So I think the current case that has brought me the most satisfaction, um, and it'll have to, uh, some of my cases are not done, but I anticipate satisfaction. But one, <laughs> <laughs> one case, um, uh, almost immediately after I got to LDF, or the day I got to LDF, I was assigned a death penalty case, which was quite curious because I had left death penalty work to move to civil rights case, but at LDF I ended up working on a death penalty case um, representing an individual named Dwayne Buck out of Texas. And in Texas, uh, in order to get the death penalty, the jury has to answer two questions. Um, was the crime intentional? Um, and is the person likely to be a future danger? And if the jury answers yes to both of those questions, then the judge will sentence the individual to death. Um, and in Dwayne Buck's case, his own attorney his own defense attorney put on an expert that testified that Mr. Buck was likely to be a future danger because he is black. Um, and so I joined that case team and it went up to the Supreme Court um, and we eventually won that case with an opinion written by Justice Roberts that said that, said that in the US or in this country we do not, um, we do not punish people based on who they are um, and so that case, uh, I think, um, has brought me the greatest satisfaction, um, not because it went to the Supreme Court necessarily, but because we have this strong opinion um, from Justice Roberts that recognizes that this was wrong. Yet, you have to imagine, up to this point, other courts have heard this claim, and said so that was fine. They had other courts heard, the Fifth Circuit heard that, and said he would have been sentenced to death anyways, even if his attorney hadn't presented evidence that he was dangerous because he is black. So to get to the highest court and to have that opinion um, and to tell Dwayne Buck and everybody that no, <laughs> being black is not a reason to sentence somebody to death, um, that was quite satisfying. Uh, and then after that, um, 
you know, the state finally agreed to um, not seek death penalty against Dwayne again, um, and now he's serving out his term in, in prison in Texas, and he writes me often, so that is a great, um, satisfying case for me. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Zara, I'm a one else. thank you for speaking. I was just wondering with the Supreme Court, what was the process, I know you were involved with the brief, the process of getting ready for such a big case, and um, was that the most nervous you've ever been, but I'm like, just the highest court, how was that process, and how did you feel going into that? So, um, actually, I did not argue the case. The director of litigation at the time argued the case. Um, and so it was me, her, um, some uh, local Texas at attorneys actually on the case. Those Texas attorneys actually brought the case to LDF saying, hey, there's a race issue. Y'all should take this. <laughs> um, and so um, it was a lot. I think I spoke to some students earlier today during lunch and said at LDF we practice a lot and for this case we had a lot of moots. Uh, we had people from across the country coming to LDF to moot. We went to DC to, um, I can't remember, the University of District of Columbia or Georgetown where we had moots there. We had um, legal scholars, death penalty scholars moot us. We had Anthony Amsterdam. I'm not sure if you know who uh, Tony Amsterdam is. He um, was a leading death penalty attorney back um, during the Furman v. Georgia days. Like he, he doesn't even work anymore, but he came out <laughs> for this case. And so we practiced a lot. There was a lot of research to be done on just discrete issues because you never know what the court is going to ask. Um, we have a, a joke at LDF that our LDF moots are harder than the actual uh, oral arguments, and um, that usually turns out to be correct. And so, yes, it was a lot of prep, a lot of work, uh, but the argument actually turned out to be amazing, and um, I actually have listened to it since then, even though I was in the room, because it was just like an amazing argument. There was no question asked that we had not prepared. Like every question that was asked, I knew exactly how Christina was going to respond because we moved it and we practiced and we researched so much. And so to be there and to be so um, prepared and to be so ready, um, it was an, an amazing experience. So what's the vetting process for this organization? Because I assume they have a very limited amount of resources and you have so many cases. So how do you choose which ones to focus on? Yes, um, so um, cases are usually brought to our attention from local community members um, or local contacts. So if I have worked with an organization in Alabama on one case, if something else comes up, they may flag it for me. Um, and then from then, you know, depending, obviously it has to have a racial impact and a racial component. Um, though I would say at a meta level everything does in this country, but you know it, it has to have a, like a direct racial um, impact. So for example, sentencing somebody to die because they are black, um, that can't be allowed to stand, right? Um, so it has to have that, that racial component and then also at LDF we do impact litigation and so it has to have a widespread um, component. We rarely take cases that uh, are only going to impact one individual, um, so they're usually just impact cases. Um, and then, you know, the attorneys there are in charge of like researching legally and factually the issues, um, strategizing about what the case may look like, and then we um, kick it up to the higher ups uh, for their uh, thoughts and opinions. Georgie, then we'll go with Dean. Georgie, I'm Georgie. Yep. Um, I'm a student here. I my question is about. Um, Working in proximity to racial conflict, you said you worked in California, Arizona, Texas, and Alabama. And I was wondering if you noticed any differences in terms of those locations, in terms of uh, the um, context in which you're doing the work being very different in terms of how racial conflict and racism is discussed and how it affects your clients and the work that you're doing. If I'm understanding you correctly, you want to know how discrimination is different in those different states? Yeah, I might say we've talked about the difference between California and Lexington and having a state holiday for Lee Jackson and how that might affect uh, where you're doing the work and if, if you've noticed that or if you haven't. Um, so I have noticed it being different 
No, I can't say. <laughs> no, I cannot say that it's actually very different. Um, some people may think that the South is the worst or the only place with um, discrimination, racism, but it's not. Um, the case I worked on in California was a death penalty case. Um, so d death penalty cases are going to have race issues and discrimination no matter where they are. Um, and, and, and so I did not see a difference about how my client in California was treated differently than my client in Alabama. Now I will say in California, my client, um, his appellate attorneys before me, he, I represented him in federal court, he has state appellate attorneys, they had done an, a much better job than I've seen in other cases, so perhaps that's the difference that, you know, in those, you know, in California, at least for that one particular case, at least the client seemed to get um, robust uh, representation, but obviously that didn't make a difference in the court because he still ended up in federal habeas. Um, but I, I can't say, you know, there's discrimination, racism everywhere, and to, to single out a location as having a monopoly on it is not true. Um, I will say I've had very difficult situations with opposing counsel in Mississippi, um, but that's not to say that that can't happen to me in Alabama. Uh, we have a desegregation case actually that just settled that's in Connecticut. So yeah, I would not say that the South has a monopoly on um, discrimination. Dean. Dean, too well. From an impact litigation standpoint, especially on the voter suppression cases, I, Georgia, Florida, Arizona, Texas, a lot of them have taken different routes. Do you see that as a problem as you engage in impact litigation, or is really a bottom where you guys able to attack some of this litigation across states in a way that, for instance, Texas State is also going to serve to invalidate some of the things that have been made in Georgia and Mississippi and Florida? Or is there not really a standard playbook for voter suppression at this point? Are they adopting different strategies throughout the different regions and states? I would not say that they're adopting different strategies. Um, so as you know, Texas has that photo ID requirement, um, which was litigated with LDF and other sister organizations and was um, eventually won and then lost and going back and forth and back and forth in the, in the courts. Um, and so their law is slightly different than the law in Alabama, but the reasoning is the same, right? The arguments are the same. Voter fraud is a problem and we need to fix it by creating this strict photo ID requirement. Um, I don't think, so I don't think the playbook is, the, is different. Sometimes the laws and the circuits are a little different. The, the Fourth Circuit may have a, a little bit better case law than the Fifth Circuit or the Eleventh Circuit, but that's not always the case either. I would say what is difficult is, um, I don't know if y'all have heard of Shelby County versus Holder, which kind of gutted the Voting Rights Act. Um, and so under Section 5, states that were covered under the Voting Rights Act would have to get approval from the government before making some of these changes that they're making. Um, and now they don't have to get approval beforehand. So for example, uh, I didn't go into detail about this, but in Alabama, the photo ID law that they had, they actually passed it before Shelby County came down, but then they sat on it, and then days after Shelby County, they, pa they start implementing the photo ID law. So they were never required to submit that law to the DOJ. In Texas, they submitted their photo ID law, it was struck down by the DOJ, and then after the day after Shelby County, they said, we're gonna implement this photo ID law anymore because it no longer needs to be approved by the Department of Justice. So what I would say is difficult is, you know, LDF has about 20, 25 attorneys. We can't keep track of every um, discriminatory law that happens to be passed. We can't be aware of it. That's why we kind of have this list of things that we ask community members to look out for and to let us know because we won't know about it sometimes, unless, you know, it's a big statewide law, we may hear about it. But even local localities were required to get changes approved. We won't know about these laws being changed and impacting communities unless people Tell, tell us about it unless we hear about it and it's, unless it's reported. Go ahead. Hi, Henry Cleveland, I'm with 1L. Um, how do you suggest that we, as both future professionals and citizens, combat those statements that are, that are intended to deter minority voters? That's a good question. I think um, first you have to call them out for what it is. Um, so, for example, the, Trump, the statement I had from Trump about look at Philadelphia, look at St. Louis, look at Chicago, um, some people don't see that statement as worrisome and bothersome because they're saying, you know, what if it's just true? Um, and you have to call people out on that because um, there's no evidence to support that is true. 
and he's focusing on cities with a majority minority population. We have heard of instances of you know people not actually voter fraud, but doing things that they shouldn't be doing in elections. Um, and from you know uh, Repu the Republican side, uh, this is a nonpartisan effort, but uh, but on the Republican side, and that's not lifted up as much, right? And so if we're really con we're, if we're really concerned about the integrity of our elections, we need to be calling it out and addressing what the real issues are, and not spreading false narratives that are either have been are unsupported or have actually been disproven. Yeah. Let me ask you this question, because during our launch we talked about so much of your work is creating a standard of excellence, and we talk about mooding, and we actually uh, have a colleague that's going to be arguing a case in the Fourth Circuit, so I'm looking forward to mo mooting that colleague, and I know some of my colleagues are too, but a lot of your job, correct me if I'm wrong, is, especially when you go into different locations, is educating the judge, the bench itself on these hard issues. Can you speak to that? Because you said a statement during our launch that I thought was absolutely brilliant about you feeling the need and you absolutely have to be a standard of excellence being this, the smartest person in the room at all times. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? Yeah. For our young lawyers in the room? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, yeah, we, we moved uh, maybe too much. We moved off the, a lot. Um, I have actually a motion to be argued next Monday. It's a discrete issue. I think my motion was like 10 pages. I'm sure I'll have like at least two or three moots on a 10 page motion before Monday. Um, but the reason we do it at LDF is because of the standard of excellence. We are um, a black organization and people sometimes expect our work, the caliber of our lawyers, not to be as good and for better or worse we have to uh, exceed their expectations we have to provide the, the best work that we can um, not only because we are not seen it as good but also because that's what our clients deserve um, our clients deserve the best that we can provide them in representation because as i mentioned they're not going to be given a fair shot very good marshall um, once said um, that he was standing in line for court, uh, uh, for a filing, and I can't remember what court it was, but it was a filing, and you know, back in the day, it wasn't simply, you type it on the computer and submit it uh, via online uh, filing, you had to like write it. And he said that he heard the clerk saying, um, this submission that she was reviewing before him, this submission must have been uh, submitted by the N-word, because it has erasures. And so Thurgood Marshall said, our writing at LDF will never have erasures. If you mess up, go get a fresh sheet, get the typewriter out and do it again because they will never know that this writing did not come from just any lawyer. They will never know that this writing came from a black lawyer because once they know that, they see it as inferior automatically and that impacts the representation of our client. Um, and so that's kind of the standard, uh, the basis where LDF comes from, why we seek to exceed so much, why we uphold this uh, standard of excellence. And I also mentioned this because um, LDF is a legacy. There will be attorneys after me. I cannot mess up the legacy of the Legal Defense Fund. <laughs> um, so, you know, this year is the 80 year history or anniversary of LDF. Hopefully, LDF will be around for another 80 years. And, you know, I could never, at LDF, we never want to uh, minimize the contributions that our organization can make um, for people across the country. Good. David. David. Oh. Thanks so much for your talk, uh, Natasha. It was fantastic. I, we have a number of students who are interested in pursuing careers in the public interest, promoting justice, probably a handful clamoring to sue racists. And I'm, <laughs> I'm curious if you have some advice for them, decisions that they can make as they navigate um, the choices in law school, how they can build a, a fantastic career like yours. Yeah, um, so, so I mentioned that my career was not like a straight traje trajectory. I thought um, I was going to be a public defender until like the end of my days. Um, and then eventually what I began to see in the criminal justice system, I decided not to, um, to, to, to expand that. Um, one thing I would say, uh, no matter what you want to go into, um, whether it's civil rights, public defender, corporate, one thing I would say, which I wish I had known, is that you should, um, I would recommend at least, that you take a diverse type of classes. 
So for example, I took mostly criminal defense classes because again, I thought I was gonna always be a public defender, but here I am, I am not a public defender. Um, and I wish I had had some of that background um, of those, some of those basic classes. I wish I had taken fed courts because all I do is litigate in fed courts. Um, so I, I wish I had taken some of those types of classes to, to properly set myself up for. Um, in regards to being a civil rights lawyer specifically, um, I would recommend a lot of whatever you can do to really hone your skills on research and writing because I do spend a lot of time with my clients, I spend a lot of time with the community, but most of my, or a lot of my work is research and writing um, and <coughs> practicing distinguishing, or not practicing, but distinguishing cases um, and making the best arguments that I can and I, so I don't think that aspect of it is really different from for, for any you know, lawyer, any litigator. Um, in regards to, to getting jobs um, at civil rights organizations, that's probably a longer conversation. And, but I would recommend, perhaps if you can, summering or spending your summers or your internships at uh, public interest organizations if you can. Um, sometimes even if getting a summer internship is difficult, you can get one during the semester. I know, for example, at LDF, you know, sometimes we're looking for interns during this semester. Um, even, sometimes even ones that work remotely just helping us research and write things. And so I think getting plugged in that way as much as you can to kind of show your record of interest in, um, in public interest work is, is important. Oh, sorry, and I should also say you should show your, your interest in public interest. You should show your interest in public interest. But um, that's not to exclude everything else. I personally summered at law firms. Like, of one summer I spent with Carlos at a law firm. And so I actually spent my summers at law firms and then I spent my semesters doing public defender clinics. Um, and so just having a, an explanation for why that is, um, is also important. So it's not that you have to spend every summer, every fall, every spring at an organization doing exactly what you think, but you should have some sort of vision explaining the steps um, that you're taking. We have time for one more question. Once that's the last question, boom. I'm the journalist in residence at Marymount University in Arlington, Virginia. Can you comment on your own interactions with reporters in cases that you've worked on and also talk about your overall impressions of um, coverage of, of the uh, election integrity issues and voting rights issues uh, right now? Well, ain't that a, a closer? Um, <laughs> so, um, in regards to reporters and media, um, I, we, so that's difficult at times, right? Because we, uh, we want to engage with reporters, we want to engage with media because we want our client stories to get out there, we want um, the facts to get out there and the law to get out there and, and what is actually going on. Um, you actually, you know, you have to put the story out there because there's going to be a story out there one way or the other. And so if you want the story to be correct or appropriate, you do have to engage with reporters and media. Um, and so, I, I mean, I do that quite often. Um, since my time at LDF, speaking to reporters about our cases, um, or going on the radio or NPR, you know, however, newspaper or, um, or TV interviews about our cases. Um, and those are probably just as nerve wracking for me as oral arguments, um, perhaps maybe even more so because um, it's not like, I think people think you can just say, this is off the record. I don't think you can really say that. <laughs> um, but you know, you know, you just wanna be as precise as you can. But then there's also the issue of translating it for the public, right? Because so I can't talk about it the way I would talk about it in court um, because that doesn't really translate for the public. So you want to convey in a way that you're being accurate, but that the public can also understand and understand why they should care about it. Um, so I do that quite often, and I, I think it's a skill set that um, I didn't learn until more recently and that I'm still working on. Um, in regards to uh, the coverage of, you asked about the coverage of elections. Um, um, I think a lot of issues, <laughs> the Legal Defense Fund is a nonpartisan organization. <laughs> um, a lot of issues are, are being covered 
And, you know, this, this I would say this narrative of, of fake news and all this stuff, I, I actually don't think that's new either. I don't think it's new to try to um, create this us versus them kind of media strain. Um, I guess if your question is more about what do I think of reporters and how they're reporting on it, um, I, mean, I think there's, there's good and bad on both sides. And I sometimes I wonder if some people report are actually journalists or they're just kind of like media talking points uh, or, you know, like talking heads. Um, but I think it is important to report on it. And I just hope people are doing their own research um, so that they can know what's true or false and what's fake news. Um, and what's real, because I think that's important. I think it's, you know, unfortunate, but probably it has always been this way that we can't rely 100% on the media um, to convey a story accurately, but that maybe has always been the case and that we just need to be able to inform ourselves um, of what is actually going on. Well, join me in thanking again Natasha Mahara.